Today, I'm gonna to share the story behind one of the creepiest videos on the internet. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload two or three times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please go to the Like Button's house and as soon as the Like Button sits down to watch their favorite TV show, start violently vacuuming right in front of the TV. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. In the summer of 2013, a middle-aged man named Frank pulled into a tiny town in Nevada called Kingston. Kingston, which is home to less than 100 people year-round, is so small and desolate and cut off from the rest of the state and really the rest of the country that they don't even have stoplights. It's basically just a collection of a handful of buildings like a laundromat and a saloon that are surrounded on one side by this huge mountain range and on the other just open desert. At the time, there were really only two reasons you would find yourself in Kingston, Nevada. One, if you lived there or were visiting someone that lived there, or two, if you were going to visit the abandoned mines up in the mountain that are right near Kingston. Frank was in Kingston for the latter. For the last five years, Frank had been traveling all over Nevada and California and just the West Coast in general, exploring abandoned mines. And he would film himself while he was in there. And then when he got back to his house, he would upload the footage to his YouTube channel. When he arrived in Kingston, Frank had already uploaded 302 videos to his channel. But despite the very high number of videos on his channel, his channel was still very, very small and it wasn't growing really at all. So for him to be dedicating that much time and energy into making these videos indicated that he wasn't really doing it for YouTube fame. He was doing it because he had a passion for exploring these mines and he wanted to share it with the few people that subscribed to his channel. And when you look through the first 302 videos on his channel, that passion of his really comes through. He always knows the history of the mine he's about to go into. And when he goes inside, if he finds machinery or pieces of equipment that have been left behind, he he immediately knows what they are and he speaks about them with relative sophistication. He has this lingo that sounds like he understands minds on a really granular level. So when Frank arrived in Kingston in 2013, as far as we know, the only reason he was there was just to do what he always did, which is go explore a couple of cool minds, film it, and then put it on his channel. Except this time, Frank's adventure into these mines right outside of Kingston would be cut short by something he just could not explain. However, he captured it on film and it's terrifying. The two mines that Frank was intending to visit were the Victorine mine and the Horton mine. The Horton mine was constructed first in the late 1970s, early 1980s. And when they built it, they expected it to be a gold mine, but there was no gold inside. So they constructed another mine about 900 feet above where the entrance to the Horton mine was. They built this other mine and inside of that mine, there was gold. This second mine they built was called the Victorine mine. When they built the Victorine mine, they bored this massive hole right outside the entrance to the Victorine mine that went straight down 900 feet directly into the mountain. And this big hole they drilled went right into the Horton mine. This was on purpose. They were basically building the equivalent of a laundry chute, except instead of tossing laundry down it, they would toss the ore they drilled from inside the Victorine mine. They would drop it down the chute. It would fall 900 feet all the way to the Horton mine and that would save them from needing to carry all of this ore all the way down the mountain. Basically, it was a shortcut for the ore. And in the Horton mine, they built this huge conveyor belt system so that anything that came off of the chute would land at the beginning of this conveyor belt and it would get brought all the way outside, outside of the mine where workers could process it and bring it to town. Finally, in 1989, the Victorine mine ran out of gold, so they permanently shut down that mine as well as the Horton mine. These two mines were located about four miles to the west of Kingston's town center. And so when Frank pulled into town, he moved to the western side of town and then found the access road that would bring him out to these mines. And so if he just drove on this road that basically shot straight towards this huge mountain range, and after traveling about four miles, he reached this very sharp right turn 
that basically went straight up a mountain. And at this point, there's no more pavement on the road. It's a very narrow trail. It's hard to see. And so Frank would have parked his car, grabbed his camera and his equipment, and begun walking up this mountain. After quite a while, Frank would have passed a couple of rundown old cabins that were kind of overgrown. These cabins were used when these mines were in operation. They helped service the workers while they were out there. But since the mines were abandoned, so too were the cabins. And so when Frank got to these cabins, that would have meant he was very close to the entrance to both of these mines. Frank first went to the Victorine mine, which would have been very easy to spot because right outside of its small entrance was this huge piece of what looked like scaffolding. And that was actually the opening to this huge chute that shot down 900 feet to the Horton mine below. So Frank goes to the Victorine mine and he has a look around, but either Frank didn't film his time inside of the Victorine mine, or he just didn't upload it because there's no video of him actually going into the Victorine mine. His camera is turned on this particular day when he's left the Victorine mine and he's walked all the way down to the entrance of the Horton mine. And so we see this video, it opens up with the camera pointing at the entrance to the Horton mine. And the entrance to the Horton mine is very bizarre looking. The entrance, which is 20 feet tall, has all these long strips of metal plating that have been kind of anchored up all around the entrance to prevent the entrance from caving in on itself. But despite whatever functional value these copper plates might have had, the aesthetic result is very creepy and makes you not want to go in the entrance. Also, because this mine had been shut down, there's a big gate right in front of this already very foreboding entrance that warns people to not go inside. But Frank seems totally unaffected by this and just strolls right up to the entrance of Horton Mine and he kind of talks about its history and then he calmly steps over this warning gate telling people to stay back and he begins walking into this mine. Right away, Frank notices there's quite a bit of water on the ground and that's cause for concern. Okay, we can go in here and just take a quick look. I don't think I'm going to explore this particular mine. There's a little bit too much water in, in here. And uh, I know this mine is really old, but uh, I just don't think it's wise to go in here when there's water. Try to avoid this if I can. Frank's not concerned that there is water. It's that the water might be stagnant water. In these abandoned mines, there can be poisonous gases that accumulate. And when there is stagnant water, those gases get absorbed into the stagnant water. And so if Frank were to step into one of those puddles of water, he would release those gases from the water, the so-called bad air, and that can actually be deadly. But as Frank is standing there wondering if he should proceed, he looks down off to the left side, right inside the entranceway, and he notices there's some footprints. So some Somebody must have come in here recently, and so Frank decides, you know what, I'll go a little bit further in, I'll just be really careful of the water. Frank makes it about 10 feet inside of the entranceway when he lifts his camera up and he looks straight down into the mine and you get your first look at really what the inside of this mine looks like. And right away, you notice there's this yellow kind of collapsed looking tubing that's hanging down from the ceiling and that's the old air filtration system. And then when Frank moves maybe another five or 10 feet farther into the mine, you see in addition to this air filtration system, there's also all these metal chains that are just kind of dangling from the ceiling and they're all over the place. And both the tubing and the chains seem to extend all the way into the tunnel out of view. Those chains were previously used to hold up the conveyor belt that stretched the entire distance of this mine, which is 600 feet long. They held that conveyor belt up, which carried all of the ore from the chute out of the mine. Even though Frank has seen similar setups in other mines he's been into, he would say on camera that there's just something really off about this mine, that it was really sketching him out, and he wasn't really sure if he should keep going. Yeah, this looks pretty uh, sketchy. I'll go a few feet further in and check it out, but I think I'm gonna pass on this one. He would later reflect on that feeling he had inside of the mine, and he would say, you know, it felt like there was somebody else in that mine watching him. It was just very, very uncomfortable. And so as Frank is debating whether or not he should continue, just based on this kind of bad vibe he was getting, he looks down and notices there's actually running water now. Before at the entrance, it was stagnant, but now he can see the water inside of this mine. It's not stagnant, it's running. And so the risk of breathing in any bad air is pretty much gone, meaning this mine is relatively safe. But despite this supposedly positive development for someone who wanted to explore a mine, Frank is still not sure if he should continue. 
This is one of the uh, creepiest mine tunnels uh, I've ever uh, been in, just because of how uh, dilapidated it is and all these chains hanging down from the overhead, and there's a shot looking down the tunnel even further a bit. But despite his apprehension, Frank ultimately decides, you know what, he'd come this far, I'll just go a little bit farther. And so Frank makes it to about 100 feet into this mine when he turns around and he films the opening, the entrance to the mine, which is all lit up with sunlight. And he films it kind of to give the audience a sense of just how far he had come into the mine. And so then after filming the entrance, he turns the camera and he films back down towards the back of the mine, towards the actual end of the mine. Now at first, you don't see anything unusual. You just see the chains and it looks kind of like it had for the first couple of minutes of this video but then Frank pulls his flashlight out and he shines it down the hall looking down the tunnel here I don't know why that one chain is swinging back there. As we saw, Frank's initial reaction to this swinging chain is speechlessness. And then just sort of this weird statement of fact that he's like, I don't know how that chain is swinging. And then after staring at this chain and even zooming in on it, trying to kind of figure out what he's looking at, Frank eventually would just turn off his camera, turn around and leave very quickly. And when he got back to his house, he uploaded this video to his channel with virtually no context. He just said, you know, this is what I saw inside of the Horton mine and nothing happened. It didn't go viral. It isn't like everybody went crazy when they saw this footage. Instead, I think his audience, they saw this video and didn't really know what to make of it. And then very quickly, his audience and Frank just kind of forgot about it. And Frank got back into making his kind of traditional videos. Then about a year later, the YouTube algorithm kind of noticed this Horton mine footage that he had uploaded back in 2013, and it went crazy viral. And immediately this video was put under the microscope by YouTube personalities, by TV personalities. I mean, everybody was just kind of taken aback by this footage. And what was determined fairly early on was the actual video itself was authentic. Frank really did film a swinging chain in the Horton mine in Nevada. The question became, who swung the chain? There are many people that believe Frank swung the chain, and this is all just one big hoax, and they point to some of his newer videos after this video went viral, where it appears that Frank is kind of actively going out to find paranormal activity versus just going out and exploring mines. And so they point to that and say, look, he's looking for this stuff. This can't be authentic. This video has to be fake. But others say, look, Frank is just a guy who likes going into mines, and he, he films the inside of these mines. He's been doing it for years and years and he just happened to be in one when something unexplainable happened and he happened to catch it on film. And the only reason he began kind of actively looking for paranormal activity after it went viral is because kind of overnight his channel exploded and he suddenly had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of subscribers that all came from that swinging chain video and they all wanted the same thing, more swinging chain videos, more paranormal content. And so seeing a great opportunity, Frank went out and began looking for paranormal content. That's why most of his videos after that video where the swinging chain happened are kind of geared towards fishing for that kind of stuff. But that first video, that swinging chain video, there wasn't really a good incentive for Frank to fake it at the time he uploaded it. Obviously now you can say, oh, well, you know, he staged it because he wanted it to go viral and he wanted to become famous and then have this great YouTube career. Look, it's all, it's all in front of us. It's so obvious. But how could Frank have possibly predicted that that video would go viral? Going viral is so hard and it happens so rarely and it's nearly impossible to predict. And so how could Frank, who had uploaded hundreds and hundreds of videos before and none of them had come anywhere near virality, how could he have said this one? 
this is gonna go viral. It's just such a long shot. It also seems very uncharacteristic for Frank to have been diligently uploading on this YouTube channel, which was basically a passion project, for five years. He's uploaded 302 videos, and all of them are the same. He's posting the same type of content very consistently for the same small, loyal following, and then out of left field, he uploads his ghost video with no context. Even if he was trying to go viral with this video, he would have known that the most likely outcome would be that the video did not go viral, and instead his small loyal following that was used to a particular type of content would see this video and be like, huh, why did he upload that? Or worse, they would think, is he faking this? Is this a hoax? And if so, that would totally tarnish his reputation and he'd lose probably some of his precious few subscribers. I mean, it just didn't feel like the juice was worth the squeeze. But regardless, even though lots and lots of people have said, you're lying, Frank, you're lying, Frank, you're lying, Frank. He said, I'm not lying. I was in the Horton mine. I filmed what I filmed. It's up to you what you believe. So that's gonna do it guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments section what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comments section. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please go to the like button's house and right as the like button is sitting down to watch their favorite TV show, start violently vacuuming right in front of the TV. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly two or three video uploads. We are now selling merchandise like flannels and hats and sweatshirts and mugs and all sorts of stuff. If you're interested, go to shopmrballin.com. If you want to learn about upcoming deals and promotions for our shop, go to our shop's Instagram page. The username is shopmrballin. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's johnballin416. I also have a ton of content over over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. We also have a second YouTube channel called Mr. Ballin Shorts where we post random short videos and lost episodes. We also have a Facebook page just called Mr. Ballin where we post condensed versions of the long episodes you see on YouTube. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.